Stay with First Kings chapter 17. Had a lot of fun with it last week. Not just fun, man. I mean principle over and over and over again. First Kings chapter 17. Mm-hmm. 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 It's like Jaws, don't it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. First Kings chapter 17. I will remind you that last week we had Elijah, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about him and the prophets of Baal. And I thought we need to back up and get him to the Mount Carmel. So when we backed up a chapter, 1 Kings 17, he was at a brook called Cherith. He had announced that there'd be no rain. The no rain statement was a statement against Baal, who was the prophet of rain and dew that supposedly fertilized the land, the heathen people, even Israel had turned toward foreign gods. When he announced there'd be no rain, everything started drying up. Ahab and Jezebel, the wicked queen, they started hunting for him to kill him. God told him to go to the brook Cherith, and there he would feed him with doves. Good church, good church. He would feed him with ravens. Sometimes God feeds you with a dirty bird. Amen. Something you're not. And I thought about that. That these, if you thought about a raven, a, a buzzard, a, a vulture, that, that a dirty bird. They are part of the dirty bird section. That they literally brought flesh and dropped it off to him. And it doesn't say that he cooked it. Was it already? You got to. Do you think like me? Was, was, the, was it already prepared? That it was brought into him. Was the bread prepared? It sounds like, you know, because they brought him bread and they brought him meat to him and they brought it twice a day. This is the first, um, uh, what, what do we call it, Cheryl? Uh, Uber Eats? <laughs> grub Hub. Amen. The first Grub Hub. Amen. And they brought it in and every day he fed, and he was by the brook, not by a river, but by the brook. Amen. So it, it, it ran dry. But one of the things we learned last week is when God guides, he provides. Anytime that God guides you somewhere, he'll provide for you. And when God guides you, he hides you because he hid him by the brook so that Ahab couldn't find him. Amen. Another thing we talked about last week was prosperity depends more on wanting what you have than having what you want. A lot of times we just want more and more, but you appreciate what you already got. Amen. And thank God for what you already have. And God doesn't replace the natural with the supernatural. God always has the supernatural to your natural. So there was a natural brook. Then he added the ravens there to feed them. Watch God do something like that in your own life. And when God's provision comes to an end, it's time to pivot. Everybody say pivot. That's so important. When, when you run out, when the brook dries up, it's time to pivot. You can't just sit there and dig through the mud and try to get water back. There's no water. We've been without water now, what, two, a little over two weeks, three weeks around here, and some people are already crying. It's, but imagine three years worth, just the ground is sucked up dry. There's no dew. There's no fruit. There's no vegetables. Amen. The animals are dying. It's an emaciated time in life here. And so at that moment, God said, it's time for you to pivot. I want you to go to Zarephath. Amen. I want you to go to another town. When God provides for you, it's good. But when he provides through you, it's better. We're going to walk into it. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 7. I'll leave you seated because i got to move quick. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon, and dwell there. Hang out there. Behold, I've commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. In other words, she's gone through much difficulty. Her husband has died. So he got up, he went to Zarephath, and when he got to the gate of the city, behold, a, a widow woman was there. She, but she was gathering sticks. Well, maybe, I don't know what she's doing, but she's gathering sticks. And he called her and he said, hey, bring me a little bit of water. And she brought him a little bit of water that I may drink, verse 11. And as she was going to fetch it, I'm reading out of the King James here, he, he called her and said, oh, yeah, uh, and bring me a morsel of bread and she said, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. 
And behold, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go and dress it for me and my son or prepare it for my son and I that we may eat. It doesn't speak of the age of the son, but we believe he's a young man, that he may eat it and die. We're going to eat and die. And Elijah said unto her, don't be afraid. Go and do as I've said, but first make me a little cake first and bring it to me. And after, make it for you and your son. Now, hold on. What are you talking about? If I make you a cake, I ain't going to have food or, or flour or meal to make us a cake. But I'm going to do what you just, just told me to do. Next verse here. For thus saith the Lord, God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to what he said. And he and her and the little boy and the house did eat many days, and the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. Father, I thank you for your word. There are many here today that took last week's word to heart, but now we had to pivot. We've moved to a new place, and there's going to be times when we're going to run spiritually dry. We're going to need your help in Jesus' name. Amen? This morning, I want to preach to you a message called Running on Empty. You ever just felt like you were out of energy? That you were running on fumes. Ah, and you're in your twenties, you don't think this way. But wait till you get a little gray. Maybe you're about to run out of ideas for your business. You're about to run out of ways to get through to your kid or your grandkid. You're about to run out of patience, run out of desire, run out of passion, run out of time. Amen. When the, when the pool ran dry, it was time for Elijah to pivot. And God called him to go to a city outside called Zarephath, which, by the way, which was where uh, Jezebel, the politician who served Baal, who sacrificed babies. Mm. Not talking about America today. He's parched. He's famished. You can imagine the thirst. He's walked from the brook into a city. He's walked miles. He's, he's gone without drink. He's running on empty. He's, he's tired. He's, he's wore out. He's famished here. And when he gets there, he meets a woman there that God told him was going to take care of him, going to look after him. And I can imagine in his mind, he's thinking, this lady's got it all together. She's got, a, she's stored up for the uh, the drought, she's got canned goods, and she's got ammunition, and she's got all the great things that you need to take care of you during this time. She's got a, 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 a plethora of, of, of water and wines and liquid and, 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 and Diet Coke. <laughs> Amen. And so when he gets there, verse 10, he said, hey, ma'am, would you, would you get me a little water in a vessel that I, I can drink? And she said, you got it. I'm going to go get you a little water. And he said, oh, and by the way, bring me a morsel of bread. Give me a little bit of bread. At that moment... She was good with getting him a little water because she got a little water. Now, she's set up to die. She knows she's going to die. But when he said, bring me a little bread, it triggered her. You understand trigger? It's that button you mash. Amen. When you know somebody, you got a button that you can mash that when you touch it. Marie, you know about Robert's buttons. I know you do. Amen. And, and when you hit that button, oh, you just triggered them at that. And he triggered her, and she spun around. Amen. And bread, you want bread? Amen. We're in a drought. I'm going to go home and make a little bit of bread, and me and my boy are going to eat it and die, and you won't. Triggers. Oh, we all got them. We all got them. Some of you have not learned how to hide your buttons. I mean, they just kind of stick out. Even I can find them. And I don't know you as well as your spouse does, but your spouse knows about them. Got to learn to hide them. Listen to me. <clears throat> She's triggered because she had so little. When you feel limited, you operate in fear instead of faith. And it's easy to get triggered when you have little. You know, I thought people sometimes were being selfish beneath what appeared as selfish behavior, like she's trying to hold on to something, was really that they were scared. It's easy to mistake scared for selfishness. Essentially, the woman asked Elijah, who do you think I am? Who, who do you think? I have a little meal and a little oil left, and, and this is going to be our last supper. And for, and for Elijah at this moment, he's got to think, God, are you sure? 
Are you sure? Amen. Because in verse 8, it said, the word of the Lord came to him saying, arise, get there. There's a woman that's going to take care of you. I often wonder what they must have been like for Elijah. God told him that this widow would feed him. But when he sees the woman, she is emaciated. When he sees the little boy, he sees little sticks on him. He, his little stomach is swollen. And I can see her uh, measuring out her meal, measuring out her flour and oil to, to months, weeks, days. She's measuring out her food to make sure she's got a, how much she's going to last. And she gets down to the last day, the last meal. I want you to catch this. It's the last day, the last meal, and then the man of God shows up, Elijah. God is always on time. Not your time. His time. And he brings Elijah into her situation. And when he gets there, everything shifts. Amen. Because at this moment, God, he's got to be thinking, God, I don't think you're sure about this. Because I thought you told this woman to take care of me. And she acts like she never heard of me. She's ne she not even ready for me. This is where faith and uh, came in. Elijah had just been in the wilderness there. He learned that God, God provided for him. He brought him bread. He, he, he brought him meat. He, meat. He was on that. Half, half carnivore, 50-50 carnivore died. Amen. Brought, brought, brought him to meet him, and, and, and he had water to drink. Amen. He was being taken care of. But can you imagine? I'd be tied up in knots. It's one thing for me to take care of myself. But for me to go in and prophesy to a woman, a widow, who has nothing, a st couple of sticks, a little bit of flour, amen, and then she's going to take it. And, and then... She's even announced, we're going to eat and die because we know this is all we got. And I've got to tell her that God told me that if you feed me first, sounds selfish, don't it? If you feed me first, that God would provide for you. So I got to have faith to believe for me, but now I got to have faith to believe for her and this little boy. Sometimes in life, it's easy for you to believe for you, but to believe for your wife, for your children, Amen. For the, your church, for your business, amen. For your school, for those around you, they're counting on you. People are counting on you to believe. And you say, well, that, I can do that. Can you do that? Will you do that? Will you believe for your family? Acts 16, 31, uh, the, the, the scripture says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your household shall be saved. I believed on that I stood on that when I was 19, 20, 21. I didn't even know nothing about Scripture until then. But I stood on that verse, and I believed for my family. And I led my daddy to Jesus, my mama to Jesus, my brother, my brother. My brother sent me a message this week, showed him and his daughter and his son and his grandkids all playing in the pool. You don't understand. A year ago, my brother was in rehab. A year ago, my sister-in-law was in, in, in a hospital. They split up. Drugs had permeated their lives. I know I'm getting a little... Uh, come on, come on. But within one year, turning to Jesus, he sends me a picture of all of them in a swimming pool, and he said, look what the Lord done did. See, you know, you got to believe for your family. You got to believe for them, because they're not... They, they, listen, family are ignorant, dumb, and... Going to eat a little bread and die. Just give up. Now listen, he's foreign to her. He's, foreign. he's got a foreign God. She, she don't know nothing about this God. Zarephath is where Jezebel's from. They, they, they know that's her hometown. You got a sign when you come into, when you ride your chariot into, Zer, into Zarephath. Hometown of Queen Jezebel. Oh boy, that's something. I don't know if you've ever been through Hope, Arkansas. I'll leave that alone right there. She has a choice. Can I get an amen? She got a choice. Amen. She, got, she has not seen the provisional miracles that have sustained Elijah. And he's telling her, go make me some bread. Imagine her cradling the jar of flour. That, that little jar that she's got that contains that little bit that she has left to feed her and her small boy. Maybe she thinks, well, if I, if I eat this, we're going to die. But if I feed him, we're going to die anyway. I got just a little. 
So it doesn't really matter. Amen. I wonder how long she held that jar until she pulled the lid off. I wonder how long that she gave in and said, you know what? I think I'm going to believe what this man's going to tell me. I think I'm going to do the right thing. There are times in life when we are called upon to take the lids off. Lids represent the limits of what God can do and what you restrict God from doing. Amen. Lids can be the extent to which we trust God. Lids can be seals that keep us from letting our real selves come out. Many of us, we wear lids. That's why I love that meeting on Monday, because I met men who the lids come off, Pastor Joseph. Amen. And they begin to talk, and they begin to share. And I, I, I have one man I'm praying for right now. He, he don't know who I am. I sent him a message. I'm praying for you. Amen. What can I do for you? He sent me back a message. Can I pray for you? I don't know who you are. Can I pray for you? And I answered him, no. No. You got somebody to pray for. It's my place to pray for you. I don't want you to know who I am. I will not talk about this in the next service because he's in there. But he don't know who I am because as soon as he finds out who I am, it's going to change. But right now, I done found out who his kids are, where he works, what needs he's got. Amen. What he's done is he took the lid off. and Because this man has never shared before. He'd been in our church eight months. I didn't even know his name. He comes in, he leaves. But now, the lid's coming off. Things are starting to take place. Sometimes if we want to see God's actions and receive the blessings of God, you got to take the lid off. Amen. You got to offer God what you have. It may be little, but you know, God always uses little. He always used a little. Amen. He used a little baby born in Bethlehem. He, he used a little shepherd boy with a sling. Amen. To take out a Goliath. God always uses a little. God don't need big. Amen. He don't need a lot. He just needs a little. And sometimes that's all you got to offer God is a little. All I got is a little. I just got a little, God. I just got a little bit here and here. I got a little tithe. I got a little time. Amen. I got, pick that up for me real quick. Amen. I, I, got, I got a little. Put that right in here. I need that morsel. Thank you. Amen. I, I got a little I got a little treasure. I just got a little. You take your little. Sometimes your little is what we call seed. Come on. Frank. Ain't got much. But Frank, I can plant a little seed and watch and see what the Lord does. Amen. So all, he, all she said, I just got a little. I, I don't know what to do with this. But if I take the lid off, and listen to me, some of you got just a little praise. I hear you. I'm up here on the front row. And every now and then I hear a little squeak in the back. I said, what is that? I've never heard that praise before. But all of a sudden, sincerely, somebody started letting their praise out. Amen. They started lifting their voice. Could you give God a little praise this morning? Yeah. Amen. Come on. Could you give God a little praise this morning? Yeah. Amen. Just lift you. See, I want to tell you something. There's something about when you give God praise, it raises you up. And the higher you get, yeah. Mm, amen. The higher you get, when I'm in a plane and I look down, I remember the first time I was in a plane and I looked down. This is weird. I saw circles in the earth and I thought aliens. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't know. I mean, I'm a country boy. I've never seen nothing like that before. But I saw circles and I didn't even understand what them circles were about until I took my daughter up to Colorado and I saw the, the, the irrigation. That, that circles like this, that does the alfalfa fields. And then I go, oh, look at the circles. Wow, that explains. Go back where I'm from, everything's in a square. And everybody I met were squares. <laughs> but it, all your problems get smaller the higher you get. And if I can give God praise for my situation, if I can magnify God, if I can lift him up, all of a sudden, if the higher I get, the smaller the problem gets. Many times what we stay right here with our problem and all we see is this. But if I can just get a little higher, amen, if I can lift it up a little bit more. So she had to dread this day. She knew on the calendar, marking the calendar, that this day was coming. And she saved up a little bit of bread, a little bit of flour. And she went out and gathered a couple of sticks. She couldn't gather a lot. There probably wasn't even a lot to gather. But a couple of sticks is all she needed for a little bit of fire to build this. This widow pours a small bit of meal out of the jar and fashions a little cake from it. She had been dreading this day a long time. She had been rationing, using just a little every day, just enough to survive. 
And this would be the last of it. And then a stranger shows up. And she offers him this hospitality. She looks at her child, his belly bloated, his arms and legs are sticks, and his eyes are jaundiced. He's looking at her as she prepares a meal for someone else. Maybe she's thinking, he's giving me some hope. Maybe his God will come through for us and save us. I don't have no options here. The little boy's tummy aches with hunger. The smell of the bread is permeating through the house. She takes the bread and passes it past her little boy as he sniffs it, needing just anything to eat. And she walks outside and she hands it to Elijah. And Elijah eats it. And she goes back in the house and thinks, that's it. And then she reaches inside of her jar and she looks in it. And when she opens it up, she realizes it's full. And she makes a cake. Now, I ain't making a couple biscuits. I'm making a cake. Amen. I mean, and she reaches against the oil, and she starts pouring the oil. And as she's pouring the oil, there's, there's more oil than she can imagine. Amen. And she's, she's pouring and pouring. And they say, okay. And she, and she empties it out, and she empties it out. And they eat. Oh, it's such a good day. We ate. Elijah's laughing. She's laughing. He's telling stories. I mean, I had ravens feeding me. They were bringing me biscuits and fried pork chops. Amen. And one day I looked at the ravens and I said, tomorrow, would you bring me a steak? And they brought me steaks. And I, I said, the next day, I said, bring me a chicken. They brought me chicken. Can you imagine a bird bringing chicken? And they're laughing and stuff. And then the next day, she go back in the kitchen. Amen. And looks at that empty thing. And there's flour in it, and there's oil in it. And she goes, oh, my goodness. He, he's telling me to. And every day, it never ran out. It never ran out. Why? Because she took the lid off, and she believed God. Faith is spelt R-I-S-K. You've heard me say this for years. Faith is risk. It's stepping out. You have to take risks to be faithful. You have to step out in faith to receive all that God wants to provide for your life. Amen. Whether it be taking a job, whether it be connecting with people, amen, you got to take a step. you got, you got to believe God. Amen. You have to. You have to step out. Is there something that you feel tugging at your heart? A, a faith moment? Is something to step out? You know, this widow, Azarephath, she was faithful with the little. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said this. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Lift your hand if you want much. Get the hand up, Sherman. Get the hand in there. There you go. Don't lie to me. I know you do. Amen. Now lift your hand if you got little. That's every one of us. Can I get an amen? We all got a little, but we're trusting God for much. I don't know what it is. God thinks, you know what, Pastor Jerry? I think you need another dog. You've been faithful with one dog. I think I'll give you four. Josh? Listen to me. Whoever can be trusted with much and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. That's when people tell me, Pastor, if I win the lottery, you're going to get a tithe. Uh-uh, you don't give a dime on a dollar now. You ain't going to give anything when you win the lottery. Quit lying to God. Quit lying to me. Amen. So it's very important to understand that if, I, if God gives me little, I'm faithful with that little. See, life is little, line upon line, precept on precept, glory to glory. God starts moving us up. We can even argue that it's, it's only a little that you have left. I, I'm going to bless the Lord with that. What little that you have that you can be more faithful with? When I saw these men show up yesterday, some of them I hadn't seen literally, literally in months. But one man came to me, and I, I do. Man, man, you're going to come out and you're going to put your machines to work. Your, I, I, I went out to pay him. And I've tried this all the time. He looked at me and said, Pastor Jerry, this is my church. Yeah, I may not be here every Sunday, but I watch you on Sundays. You know, and we work and we build and we do what we do. But it's my house. Amen. And I'm, I'm faithful with this house. And you got trees down, we're going to get here and take care of it. <sighs> Again, how, you can't do this thing alone. 
Got to have help, Tommy. You had a friend come in here this week, last week. Amen. Went through this building, helped me out with some stuff, and then told me he's going to send you the bill. I was so excited. <laughs> I got to quit. I know. I know. But he said, because of his relationship with you two, he wanted to come to this church. He, he's coming. I know. We sat right here. I bet I talked 30 minutes to that man. I got to close. He helped her. No, 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 no. She helped him. She believed, she could have said, no, I ain't giving you my last two morsels of bread. That's for me and my boy. We're going to eat it and we're going to die. And since you're a preacher, you can just do our funeral. I, I meet people this way. <laughs> we ain't doing nothing. I ain't listening to anything you say. I don't believe in your heaven. Don't believe in your God. Don't believe in any of that. I'm going to do what I want. Just leave me alone. She could have said that. But instead, she believed the man of God. And see, I would struggle with it. I would struggle. I would struggle doing what Elijah did. But I'm Jerry. I'm not Elijah. God didn't call me to do it. So she helped him. And I don't know how long days, months. But we know that there are three years that's got to go past between the creek, the brook of Cherith, the home of the widow, till he gets to Mount Carmel. We know there's at least three years that take place there. So there's provision. He's Jehovah Jireh. God my provider. Now I'll close with this. Verse 17. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What do you have against me? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? So in that relationship of days that they were together and she was eating, and she must have confessed to him a sin a failure, something that she'd done, and he knew it. That's why I tell folk, don't, don't confess. You can tell me about your faults, but don't tell me about your sins. You hear me? I, I, I'm not a priest. God is. Tell God. Don't tell Mary. Tell God. Talk to Jesus. Amen. I, I can hear your faults. We can help each other. But I'm not a priest. But something she said to him, she remembered. And we do at times. We'll, 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 we talk to We have accountability. And people know about us. and At least folk know about me. So here. And he said, she said, what do you have that my son? And he said, give me your son. Elijah replied. He took him from her arms. Which tells me that he's probably a, a small lad. He carried him up to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his bed. Then he cried to the Lord. Lord my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I'm staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched. Listen to the honesty. When's the last time you got honest with God? When's the last time you said, God, why me? I know, Katie. You hear me? Why me? I know you have. You got to. You got to get honest with God. Why did you do this? You brought me here and now he's dead. So there's an honesty here. Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times. And he cried out to the Lord. Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry. And the boy's life returned to him. Now, was it resuscitation? Prayer? I don't know. I don't, it's... It, something that, but it's the prayer, it's the cry, it's the, it's the passion of his heart. Amen. To see him resuscitated. There was a man that showed up at church a couple of months ago, and he looked at me. He said, Pastor, you remember praying for my mama? I said, I do. He said, you Remember when my mama died? I said, I do. He said, You remember when she came back alive? I said, I do. I never forget it. She laid on that bed. The hospice nurse was there. Her family was there. And they were arguing 
about the stuff that she had. Kids were arguing about mama's stuff. She had no breath in her. She died. And I walked in and I prayed over her. And she sat up in bed. Scared everybody in the house. And she talked and she rebuked her kids. She heard what they were saying. Now I know you say, Pastor, this it's the only time it's happened in my life. I didn't raise her from the dead. I, I, I don't know, okay? I'm just telling you what her son said. I was there. I saw her set up. I saw her start talking. <laughs> she rebuked them. She shared with them for 15 minutes, those that came back into the house. Because some of them run off. Scared the hell out of them. I'm telling you right now. She sat up. She talked to them. And she laid back down and died. I went in to visit another lady. Virgie was her name. She had, she was been out for three days, had made no motion, shallow breathing. My friend Harold called me in. My mama's going to pass, Pastor. Would you come over? I've known this woman for 20 years. I walked in. I sat beside her bed. Three days she not said a word. And I said, Blessed assurance. Hold on a minute, sis. Jesus is mine. And as I started singing, she said, Oh, for a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation. It's one of the few hymns I know. And she started singing. And then I went, Amazing grace. And she started singing. How sweet. This. Her eyes were closed as she started singing. Her son, who was at that time in his 70s, started crying. And I saw the hand of God come in that room. I've been a blessed man. Now, maybe I've not seen a little boy come back to life, but I have seen the power of God in people's lives. I believe. And you've got to believe for other people. You've got to believe for other people. Elijah picked up the child carried him down from the room you want to hear a miracle to me would be me trying to carry a kid upstairs you want another miracle me trying to carry the kid back downstairs amen that'd be the miracle for me Elijah picked up the child carried him down from the room into the house he gave him to his mother and he said look your son's alive then the woman said to Elijah now I know <laughs> now you know you didn't know here. You didn't know here. But now your boy is raised from the dead. Now you know I'm a man of God. Now, now you know that I'm a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. That part of the story amazes me. When that son passed, he took the son. Now I want to close with these words. Take advantage of each opportunity to help others. Whenever you get an opportunity to help someone, help them. You never know how a small act of kindness done today can lead to your blessing tomorrow. Had she not helped Elijah, she had no idea her son was going to die later. It was in, it was in the books. It's written down. He's going to die later. On this day, something's going to happen to this kid. We don't know how this thing worked out. But whether this happened or not, she was either going to die here with a little bit of bread, or he's going to die here. But he's going to die. So when Elijah, so what I'm saying is, is when you are able to be a blessing to somebody, today it's me, tomorrow it's you. You just don't know when. So when you have an opportunity to be a blessing, be a blessing. Compassion, you never know when it's going to turn back around in your favor. Amen? Heads bowed, eyes closed. I love this house. I love you. Lord, I thank you for the impact of your word. It comes in and it, it makes a way inside of us. Now I'm going to ask this question again, church, and you being honest with God. Amen. All you got is a little. God, all I got is a little praise to offer. 
What little life I got left to offer. What little time I got to offer. What little treasure I got to offer. Amen. If all you got is a little, just slip your hand up right now. Now, God, I pray in the name of Jesus. Would you pray this for me? Lord Jesus, make me faithful with the little I got left that I'll have much later. I thank you. I believe your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, honor God with some praise.